In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, we've been studying Matthew verse by verse, and we have a little sequitur here into uh, humility and what that is all about. And we're doing that because of uh, Matthew. Uh, where, where, where did I leave off last time? Was it uh, 18, two. Matthew 18.2? Let me... 18.4? Uh, Let me backtrack a little. And in uh, Matthew chapter 18, 1, if you have your Bibles, just open to Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, and you can borrow one if there's one sitting next to you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. Now here it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, they started to argue amongst each other. This is what happened. And they wanted to uh, know, out of uh, weird competition, who would be greater in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus points out a little child, and this child represents something called humility. And that's what we've been studying up until uh, today, and we'll continue today, uh, studying humility. And also today I was uh, looking at some of the news clips on the computer uh, concerning this uh, hurricane that passed through and all the devastation and the destruction, all of which is very uh, humiliating and uh, very humbling to us to see the great power of God in nature and God using nature and to see all of these things and all of the destruction. And uh, we might wonder why sometimes things like this occur. And as a result, a lot of human suffering is going to occur. We can see that at the pump, even outside of those areas. And uh, a lot of economic problems are going to arise. And often we might wonder, why do these uh, problems in life occur like this? Well, uh, one of the things that I noted is that uh, one lady had been holding on to a tree branch. She had a, a bed and breakfast thing on the uh, Gulf Coast in Mississippi. And she owned it, and she was going to stay there because it had survived Hurricane Camille. And she figured if it could survive Hurricane Camille, it could survive anything. And that's pretty good thinking because Camille was a, a pretty bad storm. But this one was larger. wasn't necessarily more powerful, but a much, much larger storm. And uh, the building crumbled around her. And she got stuck in a tree. And she could barely hold on 140-mile-an-hour winds. It would just toss you to and fro. And she was holding on for dear life, and she started to think about death. And a lot of times when people start to think about death, their focus goes away from the temporal things of life, and they start to wonder, what about life after death? And uh, she probably, and afterwards she said that she found God, and that was the whole thing from the CNN interview. And a lot of times disasters do bring people around to start asking questions, and it especially brings them around to asking about God. And a lot of people get to the point where they say, well, why would God let anything like this happen to anyone? Isn't God a God of love? And the truth is, yes, God is a God of love. And in fact, He loves us so much, He tries to wake us up to some things sometimes. And in this case, uh, there might be some people there who've never heard about Christ, and this might be the wake-up call for them to say, you know, there must be something... Uh, more to life than th just this everyday thing where we go to work, go to school, go home. There must be more to it than this, and there is. There's a lot more to it. And the fact is that God is love, and to uh, question God concerning disasters such as 9-11 or concerning disasters such as hurricanes, and to uh, say to yourself, well, uh, God is 
uh, not uh, a God of love because of these things. Well, it shows your uh, lack of understanding of what God is all about. And God is love, and it says so in the Bible. And God is love so much that uh, in John 3.16 it says, For God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son, so that whosoever believes in Him may have eternal life. You see, all of us as human beings are imperfect, myself included. Uh, No one can claim to be perfect. If they do, they're a bit weird in the head. Nobody's perfect, and we all know that as normal human beings. Uh, But uh, because we are imperfect, how in the world are we ever going to have a relationship with God who is perfect? And God is perfect. Well, God made a solution. He didn't leave us without a solution. And in His love, He sent Jesus Christ to the cross so that anyone who believes in Him shall never perish but have eternal life. And it is one act of faith that brings eternal life. John 3.18 makes it even clearer. He who believes in Him, that is Jesus Christ, is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And notice what is repeated three times. It's a verb. It's the verb believe. And it's repeated thrice as that says in the King James, or three times. And John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So Scripture makes it very clear the way of salvation. And in Matthew, we uh, noticed how uh, our Lord said that the way of salvation is narrow. In fact, it's so narrow, there's only one way, faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the problem today is too many people take the broad road. And the broad road is not how we might think of it, such as uh, going to bars, etc. The broad road is religion. And that might uh, take you aback a bit. What do you mean, religion? Isn't Christianity a religion? No. In fact, Christianity is so far separated from religion, it is unreal how separated we are from religion. Uh, religion is man's by uh, man's own efforts trying to gain the approval of God. And that is, uh, for example, in the Muslim religion. What do they do? They try to seek the approval or the approbation of God. How do they do this? Well, they might uh, pray three times a day. In fact, they do. They pray toward Mecca, east, three times a day. And if they're west of Mecca, they pray uh, the other way toward Mecca. And, uh, well, in this case, in our country, I guess they could pray either way if they uh, thought about the distance factor. But, uh, but that's religion. It's, it's focusing attention on oneself. And how can I be good to get into heaven? But we note from Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. There's nothing we can do to get into heaven. No good work we can produce to get into heaven. And you might think, well, I never do this, and I never do that, and I'm a pretty good fellow. And that might be true, but it doesn't get you into heaven. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's Ephesians Ephesians, uh, 2, uh, uh, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I knew that. My brain don't work right some days. Now, in uh, John 6, 47, another uh, thing is made clear. And this is our Lord speaking, who says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. And the Bible makes it very clear. There are a lot more passages, and I'll go ahead and give them to you. John 11:25. Jesus said to her, this is a reference to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. That refers to eternal security. And in fact, uh, we've been studying humility, and one of the first acts of humility, especially for anyone who has uh, never heard about Christ or who never understood that He is our Savior, one of the first acts is to let go of yourself. You see, oftentimes people in religion want to uh, do something to impress God. What do the Hindus do? Well, they won't step on bugs in some cases, and they won't kill a cow, and they'll follow certain religious taboos in order that uh, they might uh, go to nirvana. They don't have heaven per se as we know it, but it is 
of what they call it is nirvana, and they go to a higher state of uh, existence, etc. And I don't, I don't really recall in my studies of uh, of it if they think of the cow as higher than the man. If I don't know if they do, but maybe the man is uh, just a bit above the cow. But I'm, I, that's what it is. The man is a bit above the cow. But if you're reincarnated as a cow, well, then you did all right in life. But if you come out uh, as some other species that they consider lowly, you didn't do so hot. Well, that's you working to impress God, or in their case, whomever is the higher power. And I don't know if they recognize a God, but they do recognize a higher power. And then the Jews, uh, the not the Jews as in the race, but Judaizers as in the religion. The Judaizers follow the Mosaic Law. Not all of it, because uh, they think that they're in a different dispensation of Judaism, and uh, the fact is, well, we'll study that later. But as Judaizers, they think that they must follow the Mosaic Law to get into heaven. And if they break one of the Ten Commandments, well, they might be doomed for hell unless they uh, do some uh, repentance as they know it. And all of it's religion based on themselves. They're trying to gain the approbation, which is the approval of God through their own human deeds, their own good works. And as I've said, Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And I've known people who uh, thought of themselves as great, and because that they were such great family men, and because they would never cheat on their wives, and they would treat their children with the decency that they needed to treat their children and raise them up and sacrifice for their children. And they thought that uh, because of all of that, they were going to heaven. And they would say, I've lived a pretty good life. I think God will accept me. And then you say, well, was it a perfect life? No, it wasn't. Is God perfect? Yes, He is. Well, you're mutually excluded from living with God uh, not being perfect. So God made a solution. And the solution is faith alone in Christ alone. The solution is Jesus Christ came down and died on the cross as a substitute for us. And that's the only way of salvation. He did all the work. Nothing is left for us to do except one non-meritorious action. That is faith alone in Christ alone. And what does non-meritorious mean? Well, it simply means there's no merit on your part. I mean, uh, uh, when you go to school and you learn one plus one is two, you accept that by faith. Uh, You don't really have any uh, means or any empirical evidence to go up to the teacher and uh, tell the teacher, I don't believe that one plus one equals two. And in fact, in different number systems, if you've studied that, uh, certain numbers don't don't come out the same. And you can have the number system based on ten or a number system based on two, and uh, you get different results. And if you were a extraordinary genius in the uh, second grade and you could call your teacher out on it and say, uh, well, one plus one only equals two in a certain number base. And that would be correct, but as a child, you accept it immediately by faith. Uh, just as when your parents, if they told you this, there's a Santa Claus, most of us run around believing it until uh, we uh, get our own empirical evidence to say, no, that's not true. But as a child, that's why the Lord brings up the child in the passage that we're studying. He brings up the child because the child has faith perception. Everything the child learns is by faith. And now there is some times when they have some empirical evidence by which uh, they learn, such as they touch a hot stove and it hurts, so they know I don't touch the hot stove anymore, otherwise it burns. Well, that's empirical evidence, and they learn that way. Uh, But most of the uh, uh, children learn by faith. And the very vocabulary that we speak was uh, actually we derived it or came to know it through faith as a system of perception. And faith is a system of perception and one of the uh, most important systems of perception, but non-meritorious. The fact that you are a normal human being growing up in a family and you learn vocabulary words and you learn that a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat and you see starting out uh, you forget some of these things and you've seen very young children and their parents will say that's a dog and then the uh, young child will say cat and you'll say no dog and then finally they'll pick up on it. And they're not arguing with you because uh, they, from empirical evidence they say well it must be a dog because of this and this and they have canine, etc. No, uh, they do it because, well, it finally lines up and they've believed it and remember it and uh, they piece it all together and say this is a dog and this is a cat, all by faith. 
Our very vocabulary that we learn is by faith. And whatever field you go into, you have to learn a vocabulary. And oftentimes when you're learning it, you learn it uh, strictly by faith. There's no real merit on your part except beating your brains out studying once you get older. Uh, but there's no merit in really just accepting something in faith. And that is why there is no merit in believing in Christ. God gets all the merit. And we've studied that under the concept of common and efficacious grace. In which under common grace, the uh, unbeliever comes into a setting in which they receive the gospel. And then God the Holy Spirit uh, makes the gospel understandable to that unbeliever. Now, this is all done in grace because, remember, the unbeliever is unregenerate, not born again, and they do not have uh, a human spirit. We're all born into this world spiritually dead. In Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. And that's referring to spiritual death. And in spiritual death, we have no means to obtain a relationship with God by our own human works or our own human merit. It's not possible because we're dead. And a dead person has never invited anyone to a party. A dead person is incapable of doing anything. So God the Holy Spirit comes along in grace. And remember, it's all in grace. And that's because, uh, it, well, it takes you out of the equation, and that's part of humility. And you can't say to you, and you can't really even brag about believing in Christ, because guess what? In common grace, God the Holy Spirit made it understandable. And then when you understand it, you have a choice positive or negative. You can say, yes, I believe that, or no, I do not believe that. And if you say, yes, I believe it, well, that's a positive choice. And th then uh, you still haven't done anything because you're still spiritually dead. It's God the Holy Spirit in grace giving you the information, giving you this spiritual knowledge that you wouldn't receive otherwise. And then in efficacious grace, it is God the Holy Spirit that takes that information and makes it effective for salvation. And God the Holy Spirit does all the work. Now, you've believed it, but God the Holy Spirit did the work so that you can understand it. And then when you understood it and believed it, God the Holy Spirit did all the work so that you would be saved. God the Holy Spirit does all the work in making it effective for salvation. That's what I mean by non-meritorious on our part. It's all been given to us in grace. And there are several more passages dealing with salvation. Now, a lot of people look at the Bible and they say, well, the whole thing's dealing with my salvation. Portions of it are. Other portions are dealing with what do you do after salvation. And a problem, there's a problem in Christianity today and among Christendom. And that is that they do not know what to do after salvation. Yes, they believed in Christ. Uh, they were humble enough to know that Christ did all the work and accepted that fact. But then when you go up to a pastor or someone else and say, well, now what do I do? And they'll come up with a general answer such as, well, now just be good. Don't do this. Don't do that. Be good. Well, what's that mean? That is so general and nonspecific. Uh, there's a system. Uh, God has a system to salvation. Why wouldn't he have a system to after salvation what? And he does. It just, uh, they just don't teach it out of ignorance. But we'll continue with the way of salvation, and that is, uh, the, uh, this is uh, all found in Scripture, Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And, and, and then following in uh, part B it says, and then anyone, if anyone in your households believed, believes, they, will, they too will be saved. And that is how it comes out in the Greek. But notice the command is, is to believe. Nothing else added to it. And we can't add anything to faith alone in Christ alone. If we do, it cancels it out. And we'll see that uh, from Romans. Now in Romans 1.16 it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation. It really doesn't depend on our power whatsoever. It doesn't depend on our human ability, on, not even on our human morality. Uh, I am not ashamed because there are a lot of religious people who are very moral. Uh, there are a lot of Muslims who would outpray us in a second, and we might uh, think that as moral. It's, it's, uh, well, they're, they're still not found. They haven't believed in Christ. They're still not saved. And we might see Judaizers who are very religious, and uh, they go through all types of uh, asceticism in which they give up certain things. 
Uh, and I've uh, noted some Catholics who go through certain types of asceticism, such as on Ash Wednesday, they go through putting the ash on the head, and then they give up something for a couple months until Mardi Gras, and then at Mardi Gras they go out and raise hell. And then after Mardi Gras, which they probably won't have this year, uh, they put the, not, not at least in New Orleans, maybe it'll get all cleared out, they put the little ash on there. And then uh, that is something they've done, and they take great credit for it. But in Galatians 3, uh, 26, it tells us this, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. No, notice, nothing added to faith. Nothing whatsoever in Scripture adds anything to faith for salvation. And then in Romans 1, 16, I just gave you Romans 3, 20 through 22, because... Now, a lot of people think they can work by the works of the law and be saved, but in Romans 3:20 20 through 22, it says, "Because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified." We're not justified in His sight, as it goes on to say, "For through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that is the Old Testament prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, period. You believe it, guess what? You receive the righteousness of God. When you believe in Christ, you receive the righteousness of God. And on top of that, you receive 39 irrevocable absolutes. Now, over here on the counter, uh, there are books free of charge, of course. We don't charge for anything here. Absolutely not. And uh, we don't even pass around a plate. Anyone who feels uh, as if they want to give, they just put it over there, but uh, nobody even uh, keeps tabs on you or any of that. That's outside of grace. And uh, there's no begging for money or, or either. But all of that's free of charge. And there's a lot of wonderful books over there uh, dealing with some of the things that I'm teaching right now, uh, such as, uh, well, let's see, I'm teaching on uh, salvation now and not by works. Uh, well, uh, well, Rebound and Keep Moving is definitely a good one. Uh, for anyone starting out, but all of them are available and free of charge. And if you wanted to go through and ransack the whole thing, and I wouldn't care. Nobody else cares, so just take it on out, you know. Have, read it, uh, enjoy, because uh, you'll get a lot of this information. Now, uh, the, the subject is here, the fact of humility, and it does take humility for a person to come to faith alone in Christ alone because it definitely takes themselves out of the equations in which uh, they can't say that I've done something for my salvation. We get that especially from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which I just quoted. For you've been saved by grace through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it's a gift, and we've never had to work for a gift. And when somebody gives us a gift on Christmas, uh, we don't tell them, well, thank you very much, I'll cut your grass in the springtime for this gift. No, it's a gift. It's free. And God has made a system by which we can receive freely salvation. And then in Philippians 3, 9, and may be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. A lot of people can think they have a righteousness of their own because they've followed certain taboos or they've followed certain portions of the Mosaic Law to a T. Well, if you're going to follow the Mosaic Law, follow, follow the whole thing, which means you would have to start sacrificing lambs and watch them bleed. It was all a foreshadowing to the cross, and that's what it was for. And, uh, but, uh, of course, we're not under that anymore. Christ fulfilled the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, that's what Philippians 3, nine goes on to say, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Where does our righteousness come from? Faith, nothing else. And we're not righteous because of who and what we are. Oh, we could be self-righteous, but that is, uh, that's of no account to God. He, he considers that a filthy rags, as in Isaiah 64.6. So all of these things uh, bring us down to the fact that the first act of humility for the unbeliever is simple faith alone in Christ alone. Now, we also noted for the unbeliever, there's an act of humility that we will uh, perform uh, once we have believed in Christ. Now, when we believe in Christ, it does not eradicate the old sin nature. We have within us an old sin nature. Uh, because, as Scripture says, in Adam all die, and Christ shall all be made alive, the fact that we die in Adam means that it's genetic. We're born with an old sin nature. 
and then Christ comes into the world, and therefore we can have salvation. Now, once we believe in Christ, it doesn't mean our sins are wiped out. We will still sin. It's not a good thing, but we will. And that's found in 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10. And it says in 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10 that uh, if we say that we are without sin, we are liars and we make God out to be a liar. And remember, 1 John is written to those who have already believed in Christ, not to those who haven't. And 1 John was written to believers. We see that from 1 John and the first uh, verses following 1 John talking about brethren, meaning believers. So we do sin, and therefore the second act of humility is to name our sins to God. And why is that an act of humility? Because we as human beings in our old sin nature have a capacity and a tendency to uh, do something. And that is when we sin, we uh, sometimes we, well, there's two routes we can go. When we sin, we can feel guilty for it, which is not bona fide because Christ took the guilt on the cross. The second thing we could do is justify it. For example, you might have a sin of uh, judging someone, and we note from uh, Matthew chapter 7 along with Romans chapter 2 that we are not supposed to judge other believers. And if we do, we are out of fellowship. Now, a lot of times we might go into three different systems. We could justify that. Self-justification. And we could say to ourselves, I had a right to judge that person. They shouldn't have made me as angry as I am, and it's their fault. And that's what people do in self-justification. In self-deception, the second uh, phase of it, they deceive themselves into believing that they are right. And they deceive themselves into believing that they are always right. And then the third phase is self-absorption. And that is when they become completely absorbed with self. All of this, by the way, is found from 1 John 1.8 through 1 John 1.10. 1 John 1.8 and 1.10 actually deal with the self-deception and self-justification part of it. The self-absorption part of it gets into arrogance, and we've been studying that as the antithetical offshoot of humility. And now we will move on with our study uh, as we were uh, receiving it yesterday. Now, humility is what we were studying because our Lord brought out this uh, little child. We don't know whose it was, probably Peter's, but we don't know. And he says, if you have the humility like this little child, then you will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And this is talking about post-salvation experience. This is talking about uh, living your spiritual life after salvation. And, of course, the salvation is simple, faith alone in Christ alone. And since we were saved by grace, we live by grace. And that is our system that we follow. As a system of thinking, humility is freedom from arrogance in any form. Humility is uh, freedom from arrogance in any form. It is grace orientation. Now, some of these terms you might not be familiar with, but... uh, Um, I've went over them in the past, and eventually, I don't know when, but eventually I'll have a a bunch of CDs uh, ready to go. I should have them now, but uh, I got lax on that. But humility must never be uh, defined in terms of uh, what is called legalism or self-effacement. A lot of times uh, people go into self-effacement and call that humility. Or they move into asceticism. Asceticism simply means that you give up something that is a normal function in life. You give up a normal function of pleasure. Some people involved in asceticism give up television. And uh, there, there are different groups of, uh, of the religious, of the legalistic crowd who says, don't watch television, don't go to movies, don't go to bowling alleys. Well, that's asceticism. You're giving up something, and they consider this humility. But in fact, it is the most subtle form of arrogance that anyone can have. It is a blind arrogance. And why is that? Because by saying you can't do these normal things in life, you're setting yourself up as above the other people who do, and you can uh, allow yourself to look down upon them and judge them. And therefore, this asceticism is not humility. It actually becomes a form of tremendous arrogance that's blinding. And it's the most dangerous form of arrogance. 
Because if you say to yourself, I, uh, I will not, I, well, you judge everybody who does stuff that uh, you think is wrong. If you do that, you're setting yourself up as being very arrogant. And we can actually call asceticism the arrogance of the Pharisees. Remember, we've been studying the Pharisees all throughout Matthew. And uh, they would go up to the Lord and His disciples and say, You don't wash your hands before you eat. We wash our hands before we eat. Therefore, you are not spiritual. And they were talking to the Son of God. And it shows that that's arrogance. And uh, that their arrogance uh, kept them in deep water and uh, un uh, up until this very time. But it's not water anymore. So humility is not a self-effacement. It's not asceticism. And uh, also, uh, all forms of asceticism, if you want to know how to spell it, it's A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. Uh, it, it should be in your dictionary. Uh, all forms of asceticism are related to the most subtle forms of arrogance. That's A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. Now, humility is mandated for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ all throughout the Bible. James 4.10 is one of them. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will promote you. It is a Christian virtue to have humility. It is not a form of hypocrisy. And a lot of people go into hypocrisy thinking that that is the Christian way of life. And in most churches today, I go ahead and say this knowing it, that most of them are filled with hypocrisy. People who are willing to malign, people who are willing to gossip and judge others for what they do or what they do not do, people who are ready to pounce on anyone who doesn't follow their taboo. And if you don't follow their taboo, they'll be all over you. And that means uh, no humility. And this was never designed to be that way. And guess what? Guess who was most criticized on the earth? Jesus Christ. And He was perfect. You know what they called the Lord? An alcoholic. That's what wine bibber means from the Greek. Or wine gulp or gulper is actually how it comes out in the Greek. Of course, Matthew was written in Aramaic, but it was also translated into Greek into the form in which we receive it today. And wine gulper, gulper meant alcoholic. And they called the Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect human being, an alcoholic. They also insinuated that he slept with prostitutes simply because he witnessed to prostitutes. And these people were under, they thought they were humble, but they were under the most severe form of arrogance that they could never come to believe in Christ. And they could never see themselves believing in a man who actually... Uh, part partook of wine slightly. He never overdid it. He did drink wine. He did turn water into wine. And you say, but in the Greek, doesn't that mean a grape juice? No, it was fermented wine. He did create fermented wine right out of water. That's found in Luke. And he did drink of wine slightly. And uh, that means... And also in... Uh, uh, in uh, Second Timothy, the Apostle Paul told uh, the Apostle Peter the Apostle Timothy, the Apostle Paul told Timothy to uh, drink of a little wine for his stomach's sake and all his infirmities. So there is some medical benefit to someone. And some doctors, by the way, prescribe a glass of a red wine for heart patients every night. Not a lot. If you, if you drink a lot, you reverse the effects. But uh, wine was part of the culture back then. It was hard to come by clean water and Everybody drank wine, and most people didn't think anything of it except the Pharisees. And uh, remember, the uh, uh, John the Baptizer, he came neither eating nor drinking from Matthew, meaning he didn't eat things that would offend the Pharisees, neither did he drink alcohol which would have offended the Pharisees. But the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came to the earth both eating things that would offend the Pharisees and drinking things that would offend the Pharisees, which would be alcoholic beverage, in this case, wine. Now, of course, our Lord never got drunk. That's pro prohibited. And we have certain laws prohibiting uh, alcohol intake uh, beyond a certain age, 21, in most places, and it's a good law, and you abide by it. And because uh, before that time, you really don't have enough responsibility to handle it. But that's part of our laws, not really part of the laws in the Bible, but we must follow our laws. But the point is here is they called our Lord an alcoholic, a man in perfection. 
And I dare say that uh, most churches today, if, uh, let's say, the Son of God had not appeared until today, or in, he had just started his ministry today, what would most churches say about him? They would call him the same thing. And when they saw him down on West Whitner Street talking to prostitutes and uh, drinking a little wine, they would have said the same things about him. They would have hung him on the same cross. So we see uh, how our culture is much the same as the culture in Israel at that time. Very self-righteous, very legalistic, a uh, very uh, type of uh, snobbery. They, had their, they always had their nose up in the air looking down at everyone else when that's not what it's about. And that's not how we're saved, by the way. We're not saved by a lifestyle change. Remember, there was a man on the cross uh, beside our Lord Jesus Christ, and what was he? He was a thief. He had never done anything good in his life. He was being executed by Roman law for being a thief, and that's, they dealt harshly with those things back then, and that is what he was dying for, being a thief. And he had no opportunity to do one good thing in his life. But he did make one good choice, and that was to believe in Jesus Christ. And then, once he believed in Christ, he said this to our Lord, just trying to make sure that would be human nature. He said, Lord, remember me in paradise. And guess what Jesus Christ told this man, who had been a thief his whole life? He said, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Now, that's love. The man didn't earn it or deserve it. We don't earn it or deserve it. We never have and we never will. And when we come to that realization, we're starting to be like little children. We're starting to have humility. We're starting to understand grace. And that's a wonderful thing because humility is the... Well, it's, the, it's actually a point of reference. It's a point of reference because without humility, no one will come to faith in Christ. No one would be able to give up all the things that they've ever done to get into heaven. And they'll say to themselves, I got to heaven because of who and what I am. That's not humility, that's arrogance. But humility says Christ did it all on the cross. And humility says that uh, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, He cried out with a loud voice for three hours. That's why it's a linear action start in the Greek. Now, in your uh, English Bibles, it probably says, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That's Aramaic. It says it one time. But it's linear action start, meaning he said it over and over again and didn't just say it. He screamed it for three hours straight because of the intense uh, pain, the, the intense pain of suffering spiritual death on our behalf on the cross. And we know it's a spiritual death because our Lord said it is finished. The only way he could say it is finished is to still be physically alive. Is that right? You can't say it is finished if you're physically dead. So the physical death, while important, the real significance for us spiritually is his spiritual death. He finished the work before he dismissed his uh, spirit into heaven. And we note all, we've noted all of this in the past. And the fact is, the Christ did it all. And when he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, what he was saying is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he said this not because he did not know why, he knew why, he said it for our benefit, so that we would understand what he had to go through on the cross. And for our benefit, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And why? For you and me, that's why. He died as a substitute on the cross so that we might have eternal life. Now we noted that humility is promoted and mandated by James 4.10. And humility has many different uh, facets. And uh, one of those is a poise. Actually, one of them is poise. The other is courage. And uh, we might think of humility in different terms as being self-effacing. As the guy shuffling his feet on the football field saying, Oh, it was nothing, but really inside he's thinking about how great he is. Well, that's self-effacement, and it's a false pseudo-humility. And it's not true. And some of the most forceful men in all of history have had the greatest humility ever. One of them, Moses. Moses was, uh, as it says in the Bible at that time, he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Yet all the Israelites, the rebellious Israelites at this time, said, uh, oh, that man's arrogant. 
He can't tell us what to do and etc. What's he doing giving us this law? And uh, they would always go astray from Moses because they thought of him as arrogant because, well, he had to deal with two million people. And when you don't have a PA system, you've got to scream all the time. And so for the people on the front row some days, they, they would about go deaf because Moses had to have a booming voice to reach two million people. Now, I don't know if they had a system of relay in which he would say it and then relay it to Aaron down, the, down in the uh, crowd and then it'd be relayed back. I mean, that would seem to be the only way possible. But either way, he had to scream and shout constantly. Not because he was psychotic, just so the people could hear. And he did. And a lot of this resulted in them saying, that man's arrogance. Well, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, forehead would be frowned and burrowed and all that because he's having to scream at the top of his lungs. And none of it's fun, and it hurts the throat. And so he looks miserable, and so they look at humility as being superficial. And even though Moses was tough and strong, one of the strongest men in the world at that time, and very tough and very loud he had to be, didn't mean he was arrogant. He was the most humble man on the face of the earth. So we have false concepts of what humility is about, uh, today, and if we have a stern boss who makes us work hard, we might say he's arrogant. Well, he might just be an effective boss, and you just don't know it. But we would say, oh, he's arrogant, telling me what to do like that. Well, he's trying to get a job done. He has a job to do. He wants you to do your job. And it might not be arrogance. It might be complete humility to his authority who will jump on his back if he don't get the job done. And there's always a chain of command. And humility is always... Uh, related to understanding what the chain of command is all about. Now, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 33, we come to some of the passage, passages related to humility versus arrogance. And in Proverbs chapter 15, 33, it says, The fear, now this is not a, the fear as we know it, this is respect for. The fear means the respect for the Lord is instruction for wisdom. And before honor comes humility. So there's no honor without humility. This is what the passage is telling us. Respect for the Lord is the prerequisite, the prerequisite for humility. We must respect the Lord before we can have any type of humility. Now in Proverbs 11.12, or 11.2, excuse me, Proverbs 11.2, when arrogance comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble is wisdom. The only basis for having wisdom is through humility. And the reason, uh, the reason is quite clear. Uh, the reason is, is, is very clear. I mean, when you come to a faith alone in Christ alone, you are giving up everything that you can do for salvation. You're leaving it all in the Lord's hands. And you're saying, uh, Father, I believe in Christ. That's the moment of your salvation. You've added nothing to it. Now, that takes humility. Because uh, growing up under Satan's world, as we all have, we are under a barrage of people telling us to be good, to uh, serve the Lord, or they'll say that you're going to be saved if you dedicate yourself to Christ. Now I ask you a question from this. In Adam all die and Christ shall all be made alive. How can dead people, that is spiritually dead, dedicate themselves to Christ? They can't. Only the spiritually alive can do that. And your dedication to Christ as a believer is a daily thing. It's not a one-shot decision every Sunday. It's daily. And you have to make your own decision as to whether it's the most important or not. I tell you, our country is needing a new generation of people who recognize the importance of the Word of God. It must occur. First of all, there must be a revival uh, among, uh, especially the young people, because there needs to be replacements of uh, people who believe in Christ and evangelize that way. And there needs to be a revival of young people who take interest in the Word of God. There used to be a time in our country's history where they may have not had everything down theologically pat, but they made sure that they studied it as hard as they could. And they didn't have a lot of the things available to them that I have available to me today in terms of Greek manuscripts 
in terms of uh, people who have studied the Greek manuscripts. They just didn't have it. They were still going off the old Texas Receptus for the King James Version. And we've studied how some of those are very flawed. But today we have older versions going back to the uh, first and second second century, which are not flawed. It's the God breathe. It's uh, the Word of God, which is God breathed. And so we. Uh, but what I'm saying is, at the beginning in our country's history, I don't know how many of you've been to D.C., but if you look at all the monuments, uh, God is mentioned everywhere. And uh, of course, uh, the, through p- political correctness and all that, they're trying to take that all away. But it's kind of hard to erase those monuments. That's the one thing I was struck by when I went to Washington, D.C. All the references to God. You could tell it was God was on the forefront of their minds. And as a result, our country has been blessed. And there is no other reason why. Our country is so set apart in the world, even though we have our problems, we are so set apart in the world that uh, we should start to wonder, why are we so powerful and so prosperous? Well, it's all come down to us from God Almighty, who has uh, blessed this country since its inception. And we've all, ta- all the times we have problems. And a lot of times these problems that we face become wonderful points and wonderful times of evangelism. For example, during the Civil War, uh, right now, Christianity is most prevalent in the South. Do you know during the Civil War it was most prevalent in the industrial Northeast? And the North, of course, won the war. And then after that, the South was completely decimated. And then, guess what? People started uh, waking up. And they said, you know, maybe we've been doing something wrong. Maybe there's a wake-up call coming from above. And so uh, the great revival under, ver- uh, under several different evangelists occurred right after the Civil War in the South. Now the South is mostly Christian, and uh, the North, uh, they're Christians. There's a lot of Catholics in the North, and uh, uh, there there are a lot more unbelievers in the North, but uh, there are believers in the North as well. But it has shifted because there was a great revival in the South. And every time there's a disaster, it's usually used to wake people up to the importance of... uh, well, you see, during prosperous times, what do we do? Well, people go to a bar and have a lot of fun. or they uh, Not that going to a bar is sinful. I'm not saying that. If you're of age and you partake of a little bit, uh, you might be in a crowd of sinners. But who is not? We all are sinners, and we're all in a crowd of sinners all the time. Both uh, you and me are sinners, and there's no reason to look down our noses at people. But what I am saying is, Uh, During times of prosperity, during times when we can uh, be stimulated by entertainment, during times when we have enough money to where we don't have to be interested in things that uh, deal with eternity, well, we go in that direction. And our country has been prospered. And uh, right now it looks as if, maybe not, I mean, but it looks as if uh, there might be some economic hard times. It's really not that bad when you adjust the gas prices to inflation. And it's just now popped uh, the level that it was in in 1980 when you adjust it for inflation. But it's still it's still going to hurt people's pocketbooks and their wallets. And that's usually the only thing that wakes people up to the importance of these things. Because once all the entertainment's gone, they're sitting around bored and they say to themselves, there's more to life than this. So they walk into a church or they go to a place where they want to get the Word of God. And that's the way it works. But this also takes humility. And sometimes, uh, as, as much as the news media would make fun of it, it is definitely true that God uses disasters to wake up people to uh, the fact that they've been going in the wrong direction. This country has been. And I love my country. I'm probably the, one of the most patriotic people you'll ever know. But I can also understand that there, we, we have a lot of problems uh, and most of those problems, as a matter of fact, are related is related to er- uh, ignorance plus arrogance in Christendom. They just don't know enough about the Word of God to be giving it out. And remember from Hosea, it is knowledge of the Word that spares a nation. It's the only way our nation will be spared. And uh, so uh, God will bring us to that point, uh, to where we'll be... Uh, aroused or possibly awakened to the point that we need these things in our lives. 
And uh, God is, of course, the source of blessing. And what our country has done, we've got our eyes on the blessings, but we've gotten our eyes off the source of those blessings. And that is the real tragedy. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. And if there is anyone here without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, uh, we pray that uh, God the Holy Spirit will, through common grace, let them see exactly that they do have hope and they can have eternal life. And the way is very simple. Faith alone in Christ alone. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, as it says in Acts 16.31. All it takes is it's a matter of volition and it's a matter of choice and no one should bug you afterwards and ask you if you did because it's a matter of privacy as well. And I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for no other reason than for privacy. And you've been given the privacy right now to make a choice in your own soul inaudibly without, uh, without any verbal acknowledgement to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you tell God the Father, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the moment of your eternal salvation. And it starts the beginning of a wonderful Christian way of life. So thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.